Is populism a threat to democracy? This was the motion recently debated at the Oxford Union between Winston Marshall, former uh, singer of Mufford and Sons, and Nancy Pelosi, former Speaker of the House, where both of them, Winston took the, of course, con, the negative side of the debate, and Pelosi took the affirmative side of the debate. And, and this video is going to focus primarily on Marshall's comments, which I thought, by the way, were excellent, although I have plenty to add and I have a few uh, caveats to make, but overall they were very good. And in light of the recent political history that us in the West have been seeing, uh, over the past few decades as it relates to how people of many Western countries have been perceiving the forces at play working to change the fabric of their nation. So let us begin with Marshall's speech here. He does a few things that I think are quite commendable. First, let's go to the very end of the speech where he sums up the sort of uh, enemies of, of, of the people, if you want to put it in the language he used in the speech, that are a threat to democracy in his words go. Ladies and gentlemen, populism is not a threat to democracy, but I'll tell you what is. It's elites ordering social media to censor political opponents. It's police shutting down dissenters, be it anti-monarchists in this country or gender-critical voices here. Or last week in Brussels, the National Conservative uh, Movement. I'll tell you what is a threat to democracy. It's Brussels, D.C., Westminster, the mainstream media, big tech, big pharma, corporate collusion, and the Davos cronies. The threat to democracy comes from those who write off ordinary people as deplorable. The threat to democracy comes from those who smear working people as racists. The threat to democracy comes from those who write off working people as populists. Very interesting. Now let's go to words where he talks about the changing nature of words, particularly the changing nature of the word populism, where Barack Obama used populism positively up until the time Trump came into power. Then you almost always saw a shift towards populism being used as a pejorative. Go. Not long ago, Barack Obama, while still president at the North America, North America's leaders summit in June 2016, he took umbrage with the notion that Trump be called a populist. How could Trump be called a populist? He doesn't care about working people. If anything, Obama argued he was the populist. If anything, Obama argued Bernie was the populist. It was Bernie who'd spent five decades fighting for working people. But Trump, Something curious happens. If you watch Obama's speeches after that point, more and more recently, he uses the word populist interchangeably with strong man. Then you see a point here where he actually holds Nancy Pelosi accountable uh, uh, in, in terms of calling out the sort of limited narrow mindedness of many left wing minds when it comes to the riotous behavior inflicted upon American society by progressives. While they ignore that, they will happily say January 6th is the equivalent, even though in all reality, it's not in any way, shape and form. Anyone who is informed and who has read anything about J6 that is, has, that is not a a air filtered uh, media narrative will now know that. Go. January 6th has been mentioned. A dark day for America indeed. And I'm sure Congresswoman Pelosi will agree that the entire month of June 2020, when the federal courthouse in Portland, Oregon was under siege and under insurrection by radical progressives, those two were dark days for America. There's yes? Not, there is no equivalence of it. So, but yeah. so you don't agree? And it's fine, you don't agree, that's fine. But it is not what, what happened on January 6th, which was an insurrection incited by the President of the United States. So you don't agree? Then I want to see where he, he, he comes over here and he defines what populism is. He says the politics of the ordinary people against the elite. Go. Populism, as you know, is the politics of the ordinary people against an elite. Populism is not a threat to democracy. Populism is democracy. And why else have universal suffrage if not to keep elites in check? Look, this is all very compelling stuff. This is all very interesting stuff. And I think that if anyone wants to assess the question about the relationship between populism and democracy, I would say as a starter kit, 
this debate, this entire debate, is a good place to start. But I have a few observations. First, I want to observe how he uses the word elite. Though he uses the word elite in a very loose way, in a sense that it's almost all-encompassing. Right. And he also uses the word populist in a very loose way that is also all encompassing. He uses the word populist to encompass everyone who could be deemed an ordinary person and the word elite to encompass anyone who would oppose that particular vision. So what he's what Marshall is doing here, he's using a sort of class based uh, group based model of analysis here to make a point about broader political trends. And while I think class based and group um, based levels of analysis have their place, and in some instances they are absolutely unavoidable, as when we're dealing with broader um, statistical measures over time, as when we're dealing with general trends within certain demographic groups, I don't think they are the best tool to use to achieve clarity about certain political and social phenomenon. And political and social phenomena are at the center of this debate how people respond to certain things and how those things create trends that may go against a prevailing power structure is very much a socio-political phenomenon. So we're going to have to understand that with a little bit more nuance than to simply say ordinary people good, uh, people that oppose ordinary people bad. That is a group-based, class-based analysis. And I tend to want to avoid those kind of analysis, not just because they don't provide clarity, but also because they lead to simplified narratives about the condition of our political worlds. They lead to simplified understandings of the problems that we face. Now, I think that, again, Winston uses analysis in a great A way. It was wonderful. But normally, I want to avoid that. Another reason why I want to avoid that actually kind of leads into my next observation here. Both Winston and Nancy Pelosi are, in some sense, elites. Nancy Pelosi uh, was a Speaker of the House. She has served as a counsel to many different presidents. She has been, of course, one of the most powerful members of Congress for decades. She flies around in her own private Boeing 747, like her own private big Boeing plane. Uh, she and her husband have gotten rich millions of dollars off of lobbying through both perhaps unknown sources and known sources. She is well known as a Washington darling. Whereas Winston Marshall, in a very different sense, is also an elite, because Winston Marshall was a part of a band that got several Billboard Top 100, Top 200 hits, is impacted the culture immensely, and he is now a part of this sort of uh, sort of sub, um, anti-elitist push that is happening in Western civilization. He's part of he's a big part of that movement, and additionally, he's getting invited to speak at the Oxford Union. This is why I think speaking in terms of abstract groups is troublesome, because the clarity you lost. Maybe the defining clarity you need to understand just how stark a contrast is, because through differences we understand meaning. Without differences, meaning becomes opaque. So Winston and Pelosi are both elites, but they're elites of a different order. Winston is the kind of elite that recognizes his skills and his talents and has used them honestly to build a career, whereas Pelosi is the kind of elite that carries water for the establishment, is a willing propagandist, and is someone who is more than willing to betray the truth if it benefits her temporal political needs. Maybe the problem is not elites. Maybe the problem is the mentality of elitism. Because to be an elite is to be at the top of something, top of a subject, top of a particular field. But to have a mentality of elitism is to have a certain perception of the world filtered through your status that defines how you operate in society and moreover defines your worldview. Worldviews that are defined by status are unfortunately worldviews that do not see the world for what it truly is. There are unfortunately worldviews that lend themselves towards tyrannical behavior, especially petty tyranny, and they are unfortunately worldviews that obscure the nature and value of humanity. I talk about this a lot in my videos, the fundamental civilizational dichotomy between the society of status and the society of contract. Society of status was the dominant values hierarchy of the human of, of human civilization for, for many centuries. And as Hen and Henry Sumner Maine mentioned in his work, The Ancient Law, this gradu gradually changed around the 17th, 18th century when 
status, the sort of duty-bound man, became the rights-bearing individual through the introduction of the Enlightenment, natural law theory, reason as a value, all these different concepts coming together uh, as a result of a focus of intellectual energy towards the destruction of certain systems that were hampering human potential, like the monarchy and the divine right of kings and the feudal system. All of that brought way to the system of status, where man now trades with other people in his own capacity, he is recognized as a full individual, and value is estimated not on the basis of his familial lineage or the basis of what rank he is in society, but on the basis of his very humanity. And so if our value is estimated on our humanity, that means we're all universally valuable unless we do something to threaten that value. Therefore, the rules must apply to every single one of us in an equal way and not preferentially. This was the status uh, revolution that happened, the sort of contract revolution that happened, and define, I think, the basis for the United States of America. Without this revolution, you don't have America whatsoever. You have something else. You have another European state. But that's a different story, different day. So the elitism that Pelosi represents is the mentality of status, which has unfortunately convinced some people that they are to be in authority over other people and people were to be in subjection to them, which kind of fits into everything else that Winston was mentioning with the truckers' protest and the uh, the sort of uh, the sort of cause of saying democracy is the problem when Donald Trump got elected. It's not about hypocrisy, so to speak. It's about the status mentality, which has dominated the minds of so many people in the intelligentsia and the people who have the elitist mentality. Uh, in our society. And so that's one one point we should really understand here. It's not about elite, the being an elite, it's about elitism. And elitism, which is bound by status, should be rejected by anything in person, any person that really wants their society to be good. Now, another uh, observation I wanted to make here about this whole debate is that this dichotomy between the elites and the masses has really shaped Western political thought over the past decade or so, whether it be with, as, as Winston mentioned, Javier Malay's election in Argentina, whether it be with Jair Bolsonaro's election, whether it be with the farmers' protests, whether it be with what we've seen happening in Scandinavia, whether it be with Brexit, whether it be in the current protests led by Tom Robinson in the UK, whether it be with Donald Trump, I don't care what it is, whether it be uh, for a, a period of time before she sold out Maloney in Italy, we saw these waves of, of sort of of sort of political awakenings happen across the West that were largely in response to the woes of internationalism pushed forth by groups like the UN, the WHO, the uh, World Economic Forum, the Atlantic Council, so on and so forth, in their pursuit of some abstract egalitarian vision, which in all reality has is not fitting for the realities that so many people in these countries happen to live in. And this shift of uh, sort of political consciousness, as they call it, has made a lot of people define politics, not in terms of first principles, not in terms of ideology, not in terms of uh, morality, not in terms of any of these kind of things, but people have begun to define politics almost solely in terms of conflict. And you may see people, those of you who are astute or those of you who have been uh, in the depths of the internet, the depths of the sort of academic internet, you may see people qu <coughs> quoting a guy called Carl Schmitt, who was a popular German legal and political and philosophical theorist who unfortunately was also a Nazi and was a, an avowed Nazi and I would think a disgusting soul. You will see them quoting Carl Schmitt, particularly for his contribution titled The Friend-Enemy Distinction, which basically says... All political relationships can be reduced to the conflict between friend and enemy. And that is unfortunately, I think, a byproduct of the push, we, the push we've been seeing, the righteous pushes, I might say, we've been seeing against those who seek to put us all in subjection. So I think we're seeing positive things with the election of Javier Malay, with Brexit and all this kind of stuff, but we're not seeing the introduction of concepts that will allow us to sustain those positive moves forward, we're seeing a regression into old world status-based thinking that will ultimately only allow authoritarians to continue their attempt to sack the civilizations of the West. So a kind of populism that is not informed by first principles is not a populism that can produce anything more than temporary, short-term changes, which is another problem with, I think, the idea of populism. 
Populism only matters when it is in a culture that is reflective of higher values and when it is calling back to those higher values. Brexit was doing that by saying that national sovereignty, which what is the highest value of the nation? It's national sovereignty. National sovereignty is the highest value of our nation, and offshore bureaucrats should not be the ones dictating to us our policy. So on and so forth. But when you have a culture that achieves this short-term victory, but does not then use it to push forth a deeper admiration of their culture, their people, and their principles, it will remain a short-term victory. Which is why, despite Trump winning in America, we still have authoritarians managing to make every aspect of the American life an absolute hellscape. We still have people who are managing to convince us that if you do not trust the experts, you are some kind of a scoundrel in the face of, of truth. If you do not trust all your institutions, you are some kind of election denier or whatever because we haven't called back to first principles in America. Britain, despite being out of, uh, getting out of the uh, getting out of the EU, being a, be, with Brexit, still is suffering cultural crises because the British people, at least not enough of them, are remembering their heritage. They're not remembering their heritage. And if they're remembering their heritage, they're not using their heritage to push back against the anti-civilizational forces that are taking root in their nation. It's not enough to have a populist revolution. You have to have a sustained, effective revolution based on higher foundations and that's what's being missed in this conversation about democracy and populism. Now, I've gone over the flaws of populism a little bit. Before I close, let me talk about democracy a little bit. I have been one of the most vocal critics of democracy. I think that democracy actually empowers a different kind of elitism, an elitism, an elitism of the majority. An elitism that seems just because this elitism is dispersed. It's not centralized. It doesn't seem uh, to fit the, the cultural symbol of an authoritarian, of a strong man. And yet, I would say a majoritarian legitimacy is more dangerous than a centralized legitimacy because with a single strong man, we can point that strong man out, we can condemn that strong man, we can critique that strong man, and we can eventually get the strong man out of power or delegitimize them through other means, as has happened throughout history. For every for, for, for every critique of totalitarianism, you need to have a Mao Zedong, you need to have a Hitler, a Pol Pot, a, a Che Guevara. But when the people, when the masses become vectors for political action, I'm no longer critiquing an individual. I'm critiquing a whole population, which is a much more harrowing endeavor to, than to critique an individual. And therefore, it is much harder to delegitimize their rule and to correct for tyranny. That's the problem with democracy. Not only is it prone to tyranny by its very nature, but democracy itself has this appearance and this image which shields it from critique because the moment you critique democracy is the moment you're alleged to be critiquing the people, the will of the people, and therefore you're critiquing their right to self-determination. It is rhetorical conceptual manipulation by proximity. And for that reason, my friends, I think that we should get away from the language of democracy and go towards the language more so of classical republicanism. It's a very American take, I know, but I think that this, the, the motion of this debate should have been, is populism a threat or a compliment to classical republicanism? If the motion was that, I would say it is a compliment if it is backed up by first principles, which a classically republican system almost virtually, by virtue of its structure, guarantee. So in closing, my friends, I think this debate is a very important conversation for us to be having in the West. I think that the, the sort of contrast between Winston and Nancy Pelosi is just absolutely insane, and both visually and both conceptually. And most importantly, I think more conversations about the role elitism has on impacting the perceptions of us in the West is going to be even more important because if we understand how that concept works, maybe we can understand how to forge a better future. So I think this is a great A debate. Winston, you did a good job if you're ever watching this. I hope we can talk one day on this channel more about this subject. And I really hope that more people gravitate towards a kind of localized 
a political action, a kind of independence and self-reliance, which is rejecting the forces, the internationalist forces in these organizations that seek to subjugate every nation under this sort of a broader attempt to create a, a world that visualizes their ideal of heaven, but in all reality is nothing short of an airbrushed form of hell. My friends, if you like this video, then be sure to like, share, comment, subscribe, do whatever you can. Let's get our message out there. If you enjoy political and social commentary with a philosophical bent, then I must encourage you as well to subscribe. I must encourage you as well to share this video. And I must encourage you as well to just continue to support my efforts. I believe our message is dynamite and we can positively impact culture. We can positively impact the West if we keep pushing forth with righteousness and with moral conviction on the basis of first principles. My friends, study history, study philosophy, remain morally convicted, and please stay pensive. Bye, guys.